G'day everybody, I'm Matt McClellan from the National Parks Association of New South Wales. Thank you so much for joining in, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, before I kick off, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodian uh, of this land, uh, the people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, uh, both past and present, uh, for it is their land uh, that we're speaking of today. Uh, it always has been and always will be uh, their land. Um, Naturally Accessible is a framework that we've been researching and building over the last few years. Uh, we've done it in partnership with Family and Community Services, who's funded uh, the project, uh, and we've also done it in part partnership with National Parks and Wildlife Service and some other organisations along the way. And it's been an exciting process. Um, what we're going to show you today is a framework that helps improve access for people with disability through better information. This is not a new design tool. Um, this won't help you um, outright build a new bushwalking track um, that's going to be accessible. Uh, what it does help you do is take your existing um, tracks and trail network uh, and allows you to communicate that in a different way that will open up, up uh, access for more and more people. Uh, so I hope that's helpful. Uh, I'm sure it will be. It's been exciting sharing this with councils um, uh, around New South Wales over the last few months. And um, feel free to ask questions. So on um, YouTube, just, just punch in your questions below or any other ways that you have questions getting us to us. We're very happy to answer them and we'll see how we go. So as we go into this talk, uh, I'm going to start off with a bunch of theory. Uh, and bear with me on that theory because it's really important foundation to understanding this whole framework. Uh, I'm sure it'll be interesting, um, uh, but if you've got questions as we go, um, feel free to ask them. Sometimes some things will just sound a little bit weird or perhaps a bit controversial. Bear with me as we go through that process, and um, if you're still not convinced by the end of it, then I'd love to have the conversation with you and see what we can learn. So what is bushwalking? Um, this is a highly contentious question in itself. We're not going to get really into it. Um, but, but for the context of naturally accessible, we're talking about really any way people explore nature under their own steam. Uh, uh, so uh, for, for many people that will be uh, on their feet, for some people that will be in a wheelchair, some people will use uh, crutches, for some they'll be pushing a pram. Uh, but everybody does it for different reasons. Some people do it for fitness, uh, some people do it for social, for photography reasons, um, and some people will love bushwalks where there's cafes uh, or restaurants along the way. Uh, some people will do overnight walks, staying in inns. That's all good. Uh, we're not here to say that bushwalking has to be this wilderness experience um, that Bear Grylls would be proud of. Um, it, it's what, we want people to walk their own walk uh, as they get out there. So. When we talk about bushwalking, we're really talking about people doing it for leisure. I spent a few years at uni studying leisure. Uh, strange concept, um, but we studied the theory, I guess also as well as practical. Um, and after three years of study, it came down to two points. Uh, leisure involves um, a freedom of choice. To have a leisure experience, people need to choose uh, to participate and they need to choose freely. Uh, and they need to participate um, in the activity for its own sake. That's kind of the definition of leisure when it comes down to it. And that probably rings true uh, when you think through your experiences of leisure. And uh, as, uh, as we think about bushwalking, you can think about some um, different contexts where that's going to work and where that's not going to work. You might think of a school group um, who turn up on an excursion uh, to do a bushwalk, that there will be kids in that group who feel like they've been forced to be there um, and they don't want to be there and they're just not going to enjoy it. Whereas there are the other kids in there who have been dreaming about it for days and are really excited and busting and probably had their backpack on for a few days beforehand. Um, and that's, it's really important to have that um, sense of freedom of choice. And, and this is central when we start to think about uh, people with disability. Um, it's not just freedom of choice to participate, but it's freedom of choice in, in, in which particular walk you're doing. And if we look across New South Wales and we look at what walks are promoted as uh, accessible for people with disability. There's really not a lot of choice. It's a really narrow band of walks and they're usually very short. We'll talk a bit more about those later. Um, but you can start to see how it's going to be more and more difficult for people with a disability uh, to experience leisure. 
What I want to talk about now is this idea of flow. Uh, it's central to the idea of leisure, and it, it takes this basic idea of leisure, um, the freedom of choice uh, and doing it for your own sake, and turning it into a, an optimum le leisure experience. And there's this fellow called uh, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, I love that name. Uh, I think there's, what, 16 letters of the alphabet in there. Um, and, and he came up with this idea of flow. And it, it's a way of explaining, you know those moments that you have where you're just in the zone, uh, whether it's on a bushwalk or playing chess or cooking or, or whatever it is that you're enjoying doing, where time just doesn't exist anymore, uh, where, where you're just not really aware of what's going around you, but you're also hyper-focused at the same time, that, that experience is, is what we call flow. And, and this research has come out which shows to have that experience of flow, uh, to bring that about, we need to see a meeting um, with this graph on the right-hand side of people's uh, perceived skill uh, and their perce the perceived difficulty of the, of, of the challenge uh, presented to them. Um, so you can imagine the extremes of this, the outside of the flow quite easily. If you're somebody who has um, very little skill uh, in bushwalking, and you're out on the main range in Kosciuszko National Park um, and it's coming on to winter, um, the thunder clouds start rolling in, there's lightning happening around you, uh, it starts to hail and then snow and you're out there in t-shirt and shorts, you're going to feel quite anxious, <laughs> well, you should at least, um, that you don't have the skill, you don't have the equipment and the challenge that's been presented to you is, is enormous. Uh, and so um, the flow theory shows us that we're going to feel anxious um, and, and the further we go along that perception of difficult, the higher uh, that anxiety sense. But the reverse is also true. So if you're somebody who's hyper experienced um, and have a lot of um, bushwalking experience and skill and have climbed, I don't know, uh, Everest or, or, or done some extreme mountaineering um, and then you're walking through an area um, that you know, doesn't particularly interest you, um, there's no challenge presented to you, you can imagine yourself getting quite bored um, and perhaps bored to the point of being anxious and not wanting to be there. But you can see that if your skill is low um, and the difficulty that's been presented to you is low, um, then you sort of you, you hit that soft spot um, and, and you can really enjoy it. Um, and, and that continues right up the spectrum. So no matter what skill level you have, um, you'll be able to find an activity um, that meets uh, those, um, those experiences. So again, as we move on, think about people with disability, um, perhaps people who've acquired a disability, maybe through a spinal cord injury, they might have been somebody who was you know, right into um, uh, to horse riding or um, into car racing, people with, with particular skills. They might have been uh, outdoors people who have strong navigation skills. Um, or somebody who's got older um, and they have this huge skill base, um, but we're just presenting walks to them um, that are not uh, particularly challenging. Um, so, and again, we'll come back to that in a little bit more detail soon. Um, Hope you're hanging in there with the theory. Again, feel free to ask questions. Now this is where we get a little bit controversial. So let's kick into what is disability. Uh, and we're gonna talk about two different models or two different ways of thinking about disability. So the World Health Organization defines disability as any continuing condition that restricts everyday activities. Um, it seems like a, uh, a, well it's an interesting definition. So it's not talking about um, the, the medical stuff about the person, uh, it's looking about the impact that, that that condition has on their everyday activity. There's some kind of weird interplay going on there. So if I have a cold or the flu um, uh, for a week, um, that's going to restrict my everyday activity, but it's not a disability because it's not continuing, yeah? So, so disability, I mean, there's no set time frame on this, um, but, but we're talking more than a cold. Um, and for some people the experience of disability will continue uh, for their whole life. Uh, for some it might be many years, um, but it will vary. So there's two common models for looking at disability and probably the most common is this idea of the medical model, which is that disability is caused with a problem with the person. There's something inherently wrong uh, with them 
uh, whether that's uh, to do with their uh, ability to focus with their eyes or um, something with their spinal cord uh, that stops the communications going on. Um, and that if we want to do anything about their experience of disability, then we need to fix them. Um, and that's, that's quite a common model, and that's how often people approach uh, disability. And, and it presents us with um, not a lot of options. Uh, but there's this other model, um, which is uh, quite uh, liberating, uh, which is the social model of disability, which is that disability occurs when there's an interaction between uh, somebody's uh, impairment um, and the environment. So it's when these two things clash um, that a person experiences disability. And uh, that gives us opportunities to intervene. And it, it sounds very theoretical and it sounds, I don't know, airy-fairy perhaps, uh, but it has some real practical implement, uh, implications. So let me give you an extreme example to show you this social model. Uh, um, uh, it perhaps is extreme, uh, but imagine if you traveled overseas to a country where people were uh, four foot high. Um, typically, that the tallest person in the community was say four and a half foot high, and you turned up there as a you know six foot high Westerner, and um, and decided to live in that community. Uh, life would be different for you, and if you were to look back at this definition of disability, um, uh, I think it would start to ring true as you start to develop bruises on your head. Um, from bashing against the, the roof uh, of every building because every building is only five feet high. You would also end up going to the doctor uh, weekly uh, to deal with the back pain of having to bend over all the time. You would have to deal with the social issues around people staring at you all the time because you're a bit of a freak. Um, and life would be difficult. It would be hard um, if you went to go and get a job um, somebody would say, look, I'm sorry, you're just too tall uh, for this. We, we don't have um, a setup where you can work at a workstation um, because you're just too tall. Uh, it would be unsafe for you to work here um, because you're just too tall. Um, the doctors would medicalise the issues around um, your um, these bruises that you keep developing on your head and prescribe you a helmet to wear. Uh, you know, I'm pushing it to the extreme, but you're starting to get the idea that, that the experience of disability um, is very much a factor of, um, of the social setting. Um, and I don't want to belittle anybody's experience of disability to say it's not real or it's not physical, it is. Um, but the, the way that that disability impacts with the environment significantly um, uh, impacts on their everyday activity when we look at the definition. And, and, and I'll give you a couple of other examples before we go on. I know we're not talking bushwalking, we will soon. Um, if you think of somebody who wears glasses, um, my wife does, she wears glasses. Um, without them, she couldn't drive a car, she couldn't uh, do most of the things that she does uh, every day, or at least that would be very difficult and she'd have to change the way she does them. Um, uh, but it's a non-event. She wears glasses, as does what I think about a third of the population does. We don't really think about glasses uh, or people who wear glasses as having a disability. Um, um, although in so many ways they, they do, um, but, but it's dealt with um, with the lenses. But when you look at somebody with hearing aids, um, it's, it's exactly the same concept. It's just a different sense. We're just, instead of tweaking light, we're tweaking sound. Um, but the way that we interact with people who wear hearing aids is vastly different from the way we interact with people who wear glasses. So for somebody who wears hearing aids, generally as a community, we speak louder when we speak with them. We speak slower. Um, we speak as though they're just a little bit stupid. Um, and, and, and we do all these things probably because we're not familiar uh, with people wearing hearing aids and we're just not sure how to interact. But we don't do that with people with glasses. I don't try to make myself look bigger or brighter uh, or do any, anything like that. So socially, there's something different about glasses uh, and, um, uh, and hearing aids. So we'll go on to our next slide and we, and we look at this idea. I'm really pushing this through because it's central to our, to our idea of, or our framework of naturally accessible is that disability really does come from this interaction between 
uh, the impairment uh, that the person has um, and the environment. Um, and it's that interaction where the person experiences disability. So disability, the experience of disability can be um, more profound or less profound depending on how hard these uh, things bash up against each other. Uh, and there's particularly, when we talk about the environment, we're not just talking the physical environment about ramps and footpaths and buildings and doors. We're also talking about the attitudes of people around uh, and how things about uh, how things are communicated, uh, particularly with people with disability. So what's interesting with the social model is it provides opportunity uh, for uh, intervention. So we can reduce or perhaps remove disability altogether by tweaking this environment. So physically, we're, we're, we're pretty good at this, I think, across uh, councils uh, and I think across uh, much of New South Wales. We've certainly got a lot better at it in the last few decades in terms of providing ramps and um, um, parking and lifts and uh, access to buildings um, uh, and businesses and workplaces. A lot of this stuff has improved substantially. Um, we're probably still lagging in areas around attitude changes. Um, you know, we still don't see a lot of people with disability uh, in the media just in normal day-to-day -day life. When we do see them, it's usually because they're doing something very heroic um, or somebody that we're going to pity. Um, we don't just often see people with disability just running around doing their day-to-day -day life. Um, disability is usually central to the reason why they're on media. Um, and, and that's something that could change. And, and also the way that we communicate information, um, where um, that there's a lot we can do, and that's really the central thesis to our naturally accessible stuff. So hang in with me, we're getting to bushwalking very soon. So we've talked about the idea of intervention um, and that we can do it. Uh, and I just want to talk about, um, before we get right into bushwalking stuff, what kind of in intervention is best? Um, so if we're going to intervene, um, what are some of the things that we can think about so that we don't create, so we don't make things worse? You know, there's always unintended consequences whenever we make any change. Um, these are three things that I want us to think about when we make changes um, to make sure we don't make things worse. I want us to think about making changes uh, in a way that are the least restrictive uh, option uh, or alternative, uh, particularly for people with disability. Um, and an example of a least restrictive option, I'm just trying to think of one. Uh, so, so if we went to the beach, um, and, and this is becoming more common, at beaches they're rolling out beach matting uh, from the back of the beach right down to, to the wet sand area. Um, and so if I'm in a wheelchair and I turn up there, I can roll down this beach matting uh, and get to the waves, um, get out of my chair and uh, get into the surf and, and go for a surf or a swim. Another option of providing access is by providing a special dedicated wheelchair, um, which uh, in most cases I can't push as a user. Um, so I need to transfer out of my chair into the dedicated wheelchair um, and have somebody who can push me uh, to the front of the beach. They're two different options and they both have their pros and cons um, and they both have their place, um, but you can see that the beach matting for most people is probably going to be the, the least restrictive option. It gives the person more freedom. They can do it under their own steam. They can do it when they want. Um, that There doesn't have to be a circus around them in terms of having to um, get this chair from whatever location and um, uh, have somebody uh, to help them through that. It's the least restrictive option. And so when we think about interventions, think about the, um, the smallest intervention that you can do um, uh, that requires the least amount of effort uh, from the person uh, with a disability. So generally thinking about information and training um, uh, can be a really good point of start. Um, and if we need to progress down that chain of becoming more restrictive or more expensive, uh, then, then we can look at that. I want us to also think about interventions that are primarily, um, when, when we're thinking about our interventions, think about how they will empower people. Um, often we think about a solution, um, and, and that solution might be quite disempowering. So for example, going back to our beach, uh, if I can just jump in my chair and go to the, to the front of the beach uh, at my own time, that's quite empowering. Whereas if I have to go through this process of asking somebody if I can please, um, have access to the beach, um, and if they would be kind enough to push me to the front of the beach, 
Um, and if they uh, could be kind enough to look after my wheelchair uh, in there, you know, it, it's not very empowering. Um, it doesn't, um, it's very different from the rest of the community. Uh, yeah, hope that makes sense. Again, feel free to ask questions. Love to hear them. Um, and the last one is perhaps makes us a little bit nervous. We talk about um, the idea of dignity of risk. Uh, people with disability are like you and I, um, and we all take risks. Um, um, you know, I don't know whether I should admit this, but I occasionally run across the road or against the traffic lights, I run across the roads. I, um, uh, you know, when I go bushwalking, I sometimes forget stuff, and sometimes things go wrong, and I'm, uh, you know, I put myself at risk. Um, but that's dignifying for me. Um, it, it's part of what it is to be human. Uh, and it is part of, um, of what it is to live in a community, is, is to have the right to take risks. Um, but for some reason, when we start talking about people with disability or older people, um, we have a tendency to want to uh, wrap people in cotton wool. Um, and we want to um, make sure that there's no risk uh, there for people. I don't think that's a helpful way to think. Um, it's not empowering and it's certainly not dignifying uh, for people with disability. We don't want to create risks or um, present risks to them that are unreasonable or, or unfair just because of their disability, um, but we need to be careful to uh, not wrap people in cotton wool. So if there is risk involved with people um, with disability going out on your bushwalking tracks, that is okay, uh, and that is probably a good thing. We just, like with everybody else, need to be clear in communicating uh, that risk uh, to them uh, and, and letting them make that decision about their risk. And that's where dignity happens. Okay, so I hope that's helpful. Okay, so that's a lot of theory. Um, that's, uh, we've talked a bit about bushwalking, we've talked a bit about leisure, uh, and we've talked uh, a bit about uh, what is disability and how we might be able to look at disability slightly differently. I spent many years at uni studying all this stuff and uh, that's a quick wrap up in 20 minutes of that learning. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Again, feel free to ask questions uh, as we go. So traditionally, how have we looked at bushwalking access? Well, it's quite interesting. We, we, um, bushwalks that we talk about accessible are class one walks, um, and they're generally extremely short. Um, so, so here's a couple of examples, one of 44 meters, um, and that's return. So the track itself is 22 meters long and another one of 70 meters. Um, and it takes longer for somebody in a wheelchair um, to get out of their car uh, and into their chair than it does to complete these walks. And you can see that they're also very smooth, they're flat, they're fenced, they're ridiculously safe, uh, over the top safe. Um, and, um, and there's nothing wrong with this stuff. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have these uh, tracks. Um, these are awesome. The issue comes because this is all that we communicate in terms of accessibility. And if I'm, um, and interestingly, the conversation of accessibility is only around people who use wheelchairs. Now, what about our friends with arthritis or back pain uh, or people with continence issues, um, people with heart-lung conditions who struggle with uh, walking up inclines? Um, they seem to have been forgotten. Uh, when we talk about disability access, because we seem to only have one icon, uh, which is um, which is a wheelchair uh, symbol uh, when we talk about accessibility. Uh, and, and part of that comes from our Australian track walking grading system. Um, we have a couple of track walking grading systems in New South Wales. Um, many councils use the AS215, AS, what is it, the AS215, uh, no, where are I've forgotten, 2156.1. Uh, 2001 as the Australian standard um, and then more recently we've had the Australian walking track grading system come in on top of that and if we look through what it says for a walk to be deemed something that we can promote as accessible um, this is something that we've struggled with um, and want to resolve because as you look through it the walk has to be pretty well flat it has to be broad it has to be hard um, um, it has to be well maintained, it can't have any intrusions. The user must have no need for any experience when it comes to bushwalking. And for some random reason, 
um, that they must be less than five kilometres. In fact, when this first came out, they proposed 1.5 kilometres. Um, and, and why somebody in a wheelchair can't go further than five kilometres is, is beyond me. Um, and what we've done here is we've taken an urban standard um, and we've plonked that in the bush. And we've plonked it in the bush for people with disability. But we haven't done the same thing for everybody else. We haven't said, um, you know, footpaths, for people to walk through a city, we need this standard of footpath. We haven't done that for bushwalkers, um, but we've done that for people with disability. Now, there's always a place um, for universal accessibility. Um, and the beauty of class one walks is that we know that everybody can access them. Um, the, the issue and what we're working through with Naturally Accessible is a new framework of thinking about it um, so that we can encourage people with disability to get out and explore more challenging walks, class two, class three, class four type walks, class five walks if they wish, um, and helping them do that uh, and making an informed decision about participation. Which brings us to Naturally Accessible, uh, our research project, um, and how we're trying to resolve this, um, uh, some of these issues that I hope Hopefully it's starting to run through your head and you're starting to see how it might work for you and for your residents um, within your council area. So, big step back and we'll tell you what we've done. So over the last few years, we have conducted a whole bunch of interviews. Uh, we've interviewed older people. Um, we've interviewed, uh, most, most of these people are already bushwalking. Um, so older people, people in uh, wheelchairs, both manual and electric. Uh, we've in, interviewed uh, people with heart-lung conditions, people with arthritis, people with back pain, um, people who've recently had heart attacks. Um, so quite a range of people, or people with continence issues. Um, uh, so people with a disability that affects their mobility. Um, so we haven't looked at this stage at all into people um, uh, with sensory issues that don't um, directly impact on mobility um, or, or, or cognitive impairment. Um, so, so we're primarily focused on people with mobility-based uh, disability. So what we've done is, after interviewing all these people, looked at how um, we can improve access for people with disability through a standard documenting approach. Uh, and, and we'll talk a bit more about that very shortly. Uh, but before we do, how does this information help? Well, hopefully after that theory lesson, um, you will better understand it. But you can see a photo here of our colleague, Helen, who is ducking under a gate um, uh, to access a walk. Now this is a class two, perhaps a class three track. Um, and uh, for her, th this walk is automatically has to be a class two or higher uh, because of the gate. Um, but she can duck under this gate. So it's not a really significant barrier uh, for her. Um, all she needed to know was the height of this gate um, to see if she could duck under it. But before Naturally Accessible, this meant that she had to drive to the track head, get out of the car, get into a wheelchair, push up, try to duck under and see if she could do it. Um, and, and that's no good uh, to, to not, not even know if you can start the walk. And uh, so with Naturally Accessible, one of the bits of information we can provide is the height of barriers, the width of barriers, the gaps, uh, that sort of stuff. And so people can say, um, well, I can fit through that. Whereas the standard says it has to be 1.2 metres wide, a lot of people's chairs are narrower than that. Um, so if we say the width is one metre, and they can measure up the width of their chair and say, well, my chair fits, I can make that work. Um, and so uh, this information helps because they get to make the decision based on their abilities, their motivations, um, the conditions of the day, how wet it is, um, what the weather's like, what equipment they have, what support they have around them, um, and it reduces their experience of disability by giving them more options. So um, I think that's probably key to this whole process, is thinking um, about what information we can give people so they can make that decision uh, for themselves. So we'll quickly talk about what kind of information bushwalkers use. We're sort of jumping around a little bit through these few slides. Uh, and um, we'll wrap it up fairly soon um, with specifically how we document walks. Um, so bushwalkers use, um, or people who enjoy bushwalking, uh, use two kinds of information to varying degrees uh, when they go out on a track. 
Uh, there's uh, bushcraft, which is how do I generally bushwalk? You know, how do I tie my shoelaces? Uh, what do I need to put in my pack? Um, how do I read a map? How do I navigate? How do I get around generally on a bushwalk? Then there's the track note information, which is um, how do I undertake this specific walk? Where do I turn left? Where do I turn right? Um, where's the start of the walk? Uh, that kind of information. The track note information was critical uh, to our naturally accessible project. And that's where we found there was this awesome opportunity to intervene and to reduce the experience of disability by adding two extra layers of information to, to our track notes. And so you can see in this example that traditionally we've provided information on navigation, where to turn left, where to turn right, where the walk starts, that kind of stuff. Um, and we've provided information on points of interest. So, um, you know, if there's a nice Angophra tree along the way, what's an Angophra? And uh, we might talk about the lookouts or um, uh, stuff like that um, that's along the walk. What was the overwhelming um, uh, result of all the research is that people wanted to know two bits of information. What are the barriers along the walk? And what are the facilities along the walk uh, that can help them? Um, and so barriers are things um, that make the experience of disability um, higher, increase the experience of disability, um, and facilities are things that reduce the experience of disability. So we've got Bob here, I don't know, let's give him a name, let's call him Bob, um, and he's got a crutch looking at him, I don't know what his disability is, but let's say that he's got some arthritis uh, in his left knee and lower back or something like that. Um, he looks at this information um, and the fact that it's a class one track is meaningless to him because he's not using a wheelchair. He's going to walk this. Um, and so the fact that it's smooth and flat is, is not greatly relevant to him. What he's interested in is can he sit down and rest um, along this track? Uh, and if so, where? And can he stand back up again? You know, these are the sort of questions Bob needs to answer. Now, I can't do that. I can't have a grading system for everybody um, and even if I did, it's not very empowering, you know, it's, it, it's not all those things that we spoke about. So what I want to do is provide this information on barriers and facilities in a way that Bob and everybody else uh, can make the decision for themselves. So for Bob, he's probably thinking about what are the heights of the seats, um, does it have an armrest on it so that I can push back up again because he might not be able to push up from his um, from his bottom but he might be able to push up from a few centimetres higher to be able to stand up. He probably wants to know the width of the seat so if he's coming with some friends that they can all sit down at the same time. He wants to know um, the distance between the seats, particularly the greatest distance between those seats and you can start to see how he can make this decision for himself now as we provide that information. So the way that the naturally accessible framework starts to lay this out is we show it on this map as the example but we also have this idea of an accessibility profile and we do this in a way that um, presents the information um, in conjunction with everything else so we don't have the disability track notes and the general public track notes we have the track notes uh, for this walk um, and we just have this accessibility profile um, towards the end. You can still see that we use a wheelchair symbol. We haven't come up with a better symbol yet. Um, would love your feedback on that if you guys have a, um, other thoughts on that. But we, we, we kick off with this accessibility profile and as you start to look through this we're, we're showing you know that the slope, uh, we're showing what the surface is like, how steep it is and where key features are like parking, toilets, um, seats, what the gaps are. And at a very quick glance, most people will be able to, from the accessibility profile, know whether or not this is a walk that's for them. But people will have more questions. Um, so for example, uh, I've forgotten what we called our friend here, I think it was Bob. Um, Bob um, knows that the seats, he can see that the gaps, he's all very comfortable with that, but he doesn't know whether he can stand up again. So we have this more detailed information that's on the left here, um, and for each, item, whether it's a barrier or a facility, uh, we describe it in detail. Uh, we talk about where is it, um, um, how, where is it in relation to the track. Uh, we talk about uh, the measurements of it, so we've, I've literally gone out with a tape measure and measured the width, the height, the depth, 
uh, all that sort of stuff of everything. So I don't want to make any assumptions. I'm not going to assume what Bob wants to know. I'm just going to measure it. I'm going to give him the information and he can distill from that what he wants. Um, and you can see that if I have a heart-lung condition, this is still the same information that I'm going to use. If I am a um, parent and I'm going to be pushing a pram along this walk, um, I'm going to use the same accessibility information. I'm not thinking disability, but I am thinking accessibility. So that's, um, that's the idea. It's quite simple. <laughs> that's what we spent two years doing, is uh, distilling this idea of how we improve access simply by providing uh, better information on barriers and facilities. We've also helped um, solve some of the bushcraft information. Uh, if you go to bushwalking101.org, uh, we have information there on how to pitch a tent. And again, we've done this in a more inclusive way, where instead of saying, uh, this is how you pitch a tent, um, and this is how you pitch a tent with a disability, um, we just, this is how you pitch a tent, and it just so happens that it's somebody in a wheelchair presenting um, how to pitch the tent. So, the manual. What is this whole naturally accessible stuff? So if you go to naturallyaccessible.org, the link's in the description below, uh, and go to the Bushwalk Land Manager area, uh, you can download this PDF, it's free. Um, so again, we've been sponsored by Family and Community Services to do this research, uh, and we thought, let's just get this information out there. Um, and the manual goes through, and I really urge you to download it um, and even print it out. Um, um, it, it's a big manual, but, but it's it's very practical guide. So the first part of this manual um, goes through the theory, um, the first part of this video presentation, uh, but in a little bit more detail. We talk a bit more about um, leisure theory, we talk a bit, a bit, bit more about disability, um, and then we go through in detail how to document walks um, um, in terms of how to write track notes, how to um, include information on barriers, how to collect that information in the field, why we collect it, and again with facilities uh, and the like. And then towards the end of the manual, we go into detail about collecting uh, the information, how to publish it, um, and, and what other resources you have. And we include all the iconography and that sort of stuff at the end. So I urge you uh, to have a look at this manual and have a play with it. One of the things we tend to do as land managers is um, spend um, money well building tracks. Um, so we might get a grant for $100,000, whatever it is, uh, and we go out and put down beautiful sandstone steps and we, we build this fantastic thing. Um, but we don't tend to uh, put money aside for promotion, um, for providing the community with the information. Um, but a lot of this information will already be in your desk drawer, um, in the designer of the trail. Whoever designed the track will probably have the height, the width, the depth of all this information. So this could potentially be a desktop job uh, for people um, uh, to, to get this information out, or, or you might need to go into the field to collect the photos and the measurements. But, but whatever the case is, I, I want to encourage you to make the most of your assets uh, by getting out there and just spending a really small percentage uh, of the overall budget in uh, better documenting and sharing this information for the broader community as well as those uh, for uh, as well as those uh, with a disability. Now we're going to wrap up fairly soon, so please send through your questions. Um, but before we do, I want to talk a little bit. I've used the word accessibility and inclusiveness a little bit interchangeably throughout the talk. Um, but I think it's helpful uh, to, to dive into what those two words are um, and, um, and sort of unpack them a little bit. So accessibility is about um, whether a person can access a building. So we'll go back to the example of somebody in a wheelchair. It's, it's, it's a, probably an easier example. But again, we're talking about accessibility for all, not just for people in wheelchairs. But but if I was to go to the opera house with a friend in a wheelchair today, um, they're working on this, I believe, but um, to get into the main auditorium, um, the per my friend in the chair needs to go around to the back of the opera house. They need to go into the lift, down to the basement, across into another lift, up, um, and then through the staff-only areas into the... Um, uh, into the auditorium area and then uh, get assistance for down a couple of steps. So it is accessible. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't call that inclusive because I do something completely different. 
Um, so as we arrive, perhaps my friend and I will get separated. Maybe I can go with them. Um, but we're doing something that's completely different, completely different uh, from somebody else. Um, there's a building in the city that my colleague Helen and I used to visit a fair bit. And at the front door, I would walk in and I go up five steps. Um, she would turn to the right and go up this metal ramp. And this metal ramp has loose metal bits on it. So she's, her, she's announced, you know, as she comes in, it's this dung, 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 dung. I hope that wasn't too loud. Uh, as she comes through uh, and into the building, um, it's just uh, every time she arrives or leaves, it's just announced to the whole world uh, that Helen is here or leaving or whomever else. Um, and that's just annoying for everybody. <laughs> so it's accessible but it's not inclusive. So when we think about bushwalking tracks, I want us to think about not just physically can the person access the track, um, but what can we do uh, to make it an inclusive experience and the same as everybody else. So when we're thinking about our solutions, um, providing information is a great one, that we provide the information together. So if you've got a disability or you don't have a disability, you still get the same bit of information. That's more inclusive. Um, if um, access, dealing with a gate, for example, um, ideally what we want is a gap next to the gate that allows a person in a wheelchair to go through, not motorbikes, if, if that's the reason why the gate's there, um, but that everybody just walks through that same gap. Um, uh, if the person with a disability has to come to the council office to collect a key to be able to go down, it's accessible, but it's not very inclusive. So as we go through this, um, as you go through the manual and look at your solutions and start thinking about how we can improve access, um, be thinking about how we can do it in the most inclusive way so the experience of a person with a disability is similar to everybody else. Okay, so what's next for you? Um, I think, um, I want you to think about a couple of things. Your council will have a disability inclusion plan uh, if you're in New South Wales or most other states. Um, the disability inclusion plan is a requirement um, and it is a really important place um, to have the natural assets listed. Um, um, when writing these disability action inclusion plans, uh, disability action and inclusion, inclusion and action plans, um, they, it, it's a difficult process uh, for your uh, disability officer within your council to do it. Um, and, and they will have put a few things in there. Um, and there might be already some stuff on, on bushwalking or on tracks and trails. Um, but I urge you to go to your website right now uh, and just Google your council name, Disability uh, Inclusion Action Plan, uh, download it and have a look in there, what's in there for your council. Um, and if there's already stuff in there about green space, then fantastic. Contact your uh, action plan officer and think about how you can now source funding um, through that action plan uh, to implement some of this stuff. If you don't have um, anything to do with bushwalking, um, and bushwalking is a thing, obviously, within your council, then speak to your disability inclusions officer and see how you can get that included. Um, because it's important um, and it, it, it's disability inclusion is not just for the urban areas. Uh, for much of New South Wales, you know, if you draw a circle around Sydney or Wollongong or Newcastle, about half of everything inside these larger urban areas is already bushland. Um, and so if as a council we're not talking about how we improve access to half our land uh, for people with disability, then we're not having this, we're not doing this disability inclusion thing properly. So, so have that conversation and see how you can get it included. As I mentioned, naturally accessible is not about improving, um, uh, it, it's not about trying to make stuff universally accessible. There is a space for that and, and we want to encourage universal inclusiveness still. Um, but it's about looking at your existing track and trail network and improving access to that. Sure, it won't be accessible to 100% of people, but, it, but we can in, open it up to more and more people by providing better information. But as we're constructing new tracks and as we're upgrading tracks, um, I urge you to just think through uh, as you're doing that. When you're putting in a step, does that step need to be there? Um, can we remove that? Um, or can we put in two smaller steps instead of one bigger step 
um, with a gap so that somebody in a wheelchair can just go dunk dunk or somebody with um, arthritis perhaps we need some handrails uh, just to so that they can steady themselves on, on that step um, or better still just have a, a gentle ramping area. Um, think through those barriers also think through your facilities what can we do uh, in terms of improving our facilities if you already have seats on your walk um, have a look at the gap between those. If generally speaking they're every 100 metres, but then there's this gap of 200 metres, maybe there's an opportunity to drop an extra seat in so that there's this regular 100 metre um, seat uh, availability. Um, and also um, consider how you can use your naturally accessible information in your broader community. When you're promoting your walks um, on your website, have you got photos of people with disability out there enjoying these amazing places. These natural assets, assets are really exciting. Um, you, you spend so much time caring for them and looking after them. Let's share them in a way that encourages people to get out there and enjoy them. So let's have some photos of people using their crutches out there. Let's have photos of older people out there. Let's have photos of younger people. Let, you know, let's try to mix it up a little bit um, and have um, just make it normal, make it expected that we'll see people with disability out and about. Okay, just as a last slide, um, I want to talk a little bit about adaptive equipment. Um, and um, we've, we've been experimenting with overnight wheelchair uh, bushwalking, um, bush pushers is the name that gets thrown around, there's a whole bunch of different names around there. Um, uh, and so we're looking at sort of pushing the envelope a little bit. And we've been doing some um, 20 kilometre um, overnight walks with camping um, midway uh, for, for people who are quadriplegic, uh, paraplegics. Um, we've had a lady who is uh, with low vision uh, come along, um, you know, a whole mix of people. And what we've found is people love it <laughs> primarily, um, you know, uh, dads and their kids getting out there. Um, but what we found is some minor modifications to equipment, um, and again, we're just talking about people here, uh, just talking about wheelchair users here, um, some minor modifications can make a massive difference um, to access. So this is some of the sort of equipment you might see people using um, or that might help. Um, and they sort of move through this idea of least restrictive to most restrictive. So you can see this example on the top left of a lady with a freewheel. Um, this is an attachment that just clips on and off in a matter of seconds uh, to the front of a chair and it lifts the casters of the, of the wheelchair up off the ground um, and turns it into a three-wheel device. So two big wheels that she pushes with and the front wheel which pivots. Um, and so no longer is every little rock uh, and bump on the trail shaking her bones. Um, and that's probably the most common um, tool, uh, adaptive equipment that you'll see people attaching to a chair. Uh, it, it's incredibly um, useful and versatile. You'll see people using it on grass and around um, parklands as well. Uh, the gentleman on the right uh, is, a is a piece of equipment that's similar. The brand name of this one is a Baytech, um, but it's a powered version. So he rides it a little bit like a motorbike, has a throttle, um, and he can um, <laughs> get up to some quite some speeds along these trails. Um, but this is a bit of equipment that means that he could do... Um, multiple tens of kilometres um, for, for a bushwalk um, and spend a lot of time out there um, and, and carry a lot of gear as well. The bottom right we've got a photo of huskying. Now this is a technique um, where in this photo the timing wasn't quite right but this lady looks like she's just sitting passively in this chair um, but, but she's been pushing um, and her dad has a rope running from her uh, between him and her and so that he just keeps attention on that. Um, and this just allows her chair to keep momentum and she can push uh, and she can go many more, many, many, many more kilometres um, with just that little bit of assistance um, from her friends. And you could imagine school groups doing this, like a Duke of Edinburgh trip, um, where um, you, know, you might have a long push, which is really difficult for somebody, um, but they could share this husking around their group. The bottom left is an example of um, probably the most restrictive bit of equipment has its place, uh, it's called the trail rider, and you can see here that the person um, sits in the middle of the trail rider and they have uh, two Sherpas, a person at the front, a person at the back, uh, you can have four, um, but you can see that the person who is in this um, trail rider um, 
has very little control. He can, if he can speak, he can talk to the Sherpas and ask for, you know, ask them to head over to a tree or, or whatever. Um, but if this is a longer trip and um, needs to go to the toilet, um, this device is way too big uh, to get in and out of um, most toilets. Um, uh, if they're going to a campsite and doing a multi-day trip, then around the campsite he can't just push himself around, jump in and out of a tent, jump in and out of his chair as he might. Uh, and you can see in this particular example, uh, it's being used on a hard, um, hard surface where uh, at that current point in time, most wheelchairs will probably go um, with less modification. So I'm not bagging out the trail rider, it's just an example of a more restrictive solution um, uh, when there's lots of other options available for many more people. But for some people, the trail rider um, will be an incredibly freeing experience um, and allow them to go and explore um, places that they just would never have dreamt of. Okay, so that is naturally accessible. So I urge you again, uh, if you've got questions, please fire them in quickly because we'll be wrapping things up very shortly. Um, but go to naturallyaccessible.org, um, go to the Bushwalk um, land managers area and download uh, the manual, the manual uh, print it out um, and have a flick through it. It's a very practical guide on how to get out there and document walks uh, for your residents. Um, and uh, I think you'll find um, it, it's not that onus, onerous. Uh, it's, it's something that you could start with today uh, and I think you'll find it'll make a massive difference uh, to people in your community. Don't, do, don't feel like you have to do everything today. Um, don't feel like you have to launch this with every track and trail that you've document, that, that you have in your asset. Um, just look through your assets and think about what walks that you have or what tracks or trails you have that are, you know, you, you could imagine doing, um, you know, if you could push a pram along it fairly easily, then many people um, with a disability, whether they use a wheelchair or crutches, uh, could probably do it as well. So maybe use that as your base. If you think you could push a pram along it, um, then that's probably a good one to start with. And start with one or two. Share it with your community. Push it out on Facebook. Um, push it out um, to specific people in your community um, that you know would be interested in it. Um, and get them to have a go uh, with it and, and get their feedback and see how you might be able to tweak this model to work well um, for your community and for your people. Um, we do have a few councils who are doing it. Uh, if you go to wildwalks.com, uh, click on the naturally accessible uh, area, you can see we've documented 50 walks. National Parks and Wildlife Service funded that. Uh, we documented 50 walks there um, as, as examples. Most of those are shorter and flatter and easier uh, ones, but we also do have some 10 kilometre um, uh, trails on there. Um, and, and that might give you an example of how the, uh, the accessibility framework could work. Um, and, you know, steal whatever you can, make it work for you. Um, be shameless about, um, you know, taking the icons and making it work uh, at, at your end. But I urge you to just give it a go. Uh, get out there and help people um, enjoy these places that you're so passionate about uh, and that you spend so much time on. Um, and, and just, yeah, let's encourage those people to get out there. So um, we haven't got questions from people. That's okay. Um, I know that it can be a bit shy asking questions um, over the internet. Um, but feel free to contact us. Some of you already have our email address. Uh, give us a phone call, um, send us an email, um, or um, go to naturallyaccessible.org, click on the contact us, um, and we'll be able to see how we can help you. Um, but thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, I'm just looking at Steph, who's been running our social media to see if there's any last minute questions coming through, nothing there. Um, so a quick thank you to Steph uh, for organising uh, today and a big thank you to Kieran uh, for running the computer and making sure that you can see and hear me. Um, and thank you uh, to you all uh, for tuning in, for spending this time. I know your time is very precious. Uh, and thank you for taking interest in helping uh, your whole community access these amazing places. So thank you, chat to you later. Bye for now.